Good afternoon, and welcome back to One Church ATL. Or even for some of our listeners, I should say good morning. We thank you that you've joined us today, and I'm excited to be back with you all sharing God's word. It's been a few weeks, but I'm excited to be back. And I want to first of all say thank you. I humbly say thank you. Thank you for supporting this ministry in whatever way that you've supported One Church, whether it's through your prayers or through your viewing or your support. We say thank you because One Church is a ministry that has put our efforts in creating a safe place for God's people. This ministry is about teaching God's word so that we can be empowered and that we can grow and even strengthen others. One Church ATL is about going. Jesus in his word says, go ye therefore into the world. And so that's what we do. We want to go into the world. We want to reach those that are lost and create disciples of all men, women, and children. And we believe we can accomplish that through being unified in Christ and having that oneness. So we thank you for joining us today. And I miss my family. I miss my church family. And I'm not talking about the other opportunities we have through other metrics we have to connect. I'm talking about missing the fellowship, the ecclesia, the gathering. And so I miss the hugs. I miss the kisses from my mature family. I miss kissing the babies. I even miss the dap that we get from our men. You guys know how we do the dap. It's a lot of steps to the dap, but I miss just dapping up my brothers. And so I'm going to say to my brothers, don't let your dap game go down because soon I believe that we'll be back together fellowshipping with each other. But today, as I begin to just talk about what I um, uh, it's been in my heart, I want to just let you know that God literally arrested my thoughts because I had a sermon prepared and God said that I want you, Rod, to be transparent I want you to be transparent with your family. And so today I was going to go a different direction. And God says, Rod, I want you to talk to your people and your friends about what's going on in your life. Because even though we have COVID and that's still dominating our news, even though there's still social injustice that we're still uh, uh, dealing with, God says, Rod, I want you to share with your people what happened to you. And so literally about 30 days ago, I got right with some of the most disturbing news that I'd had in a long time. And that's when God says, well, Rod, everybody's not dealing with COVID. Everybody's not necessarily been engrossed with social injustice. Some people like you have gotten bad news. And the news that I got rot me to my core. And Rod, and God says there are people just like you, Rod, that have experienced the fall. There are people like you that have had their lives altered. And some people have lost their jobs. God reminded me that there are people that have had changes in their financial situation to where now perhaps we don't know how we're going to pay our bills. And I know some people personally that have gotten challenging medical diagnosis. But whatever your challenge is right now, whatever that has caused you trouble, God says, Rod, I want you to share with my people that we can bounce back from a fall. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about falling. And when you fall, God reminded me that when we fall, that we don't know, we don't, we're not able to determine when and how we're going to fall. We don't get to choose how we're going to fall. We don't get to choose when we're going to fall. But God said, Rod, remind your people that however we fall, God is prepared to pick us back up. And I have my basketball here. I'm dribbling my basketball, and it's been months since I've even been able to play the basketball. But when I think about this ball, and the title of my sermon today is Bouncing Back from a Fall, I think about this ball and how this ball has an option. This ball can literally stay where it is when it falls. If I drop this ball, this ball has the option to not move, or this ball can bounce back up. And so today I want to parallel the basketball and its rebounding to what's happening in our life. And so we understand gravity and Newton's law says that what goes up must come down. And so that's what happens naturally by Newton's law and the law of gravity. What must goes up must come down. But does a ball that goes down have to come back up? And what are the physics surrounding a ball once it goes down? 
And so I think about it, what happens is when we have a basketball, if I were to drop this ball and it were to decelerate, what's actually happening? So what happens from a physics standpoint is this ball takes on what we call potential energy. And there's potential energy that's stored. Potential energy is stored energy. Until this energy is converted to kinetic energy, this ball is just going to stay in its place. But if I were to drop this ball and it began to decelerate, now the potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy. Now it has the ability to move and kinetic energy is just energy in motion. And so when we think about that in our own natural life, potential energy converted to kinetic energy in our world is when we say what could go wrong does go wrong. Something that potentially negative that could happen in our life happens. And that's what happened to me. The biggest thing that I've always feared in my life in the last 30 days happened. And it rocked me to my core. What could go wrong potentially was converted to something that actually went wrong. The thing that I, for the last five years that I've dreamed about is a nightmare that I said, I never want this to happen to me. It happened. And I'll be transparent with you. I, in my business, was suspended. I had an incident that occurred, and the next thing I know, I had a company saying, we no longer want to do business with you. So now I'm concerned about how I'm going to feed my family. So this potential energy, when a ball drops, is converted. And in my life for the last 30 days, I saw things spiraling out of control. I saw the energy being converted and I saw the descend because that's what happens with the ball. The energy, the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy and it agrees with gravity and the ball is pulled down and the ball falls and the ball is going to continue to fall until something stops it. And that's what we call impact or collision or collusion. This ball, because of gravity, will continue to fall until something stops it. And that's what happens in our life. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But this ball, once it stops, once it, once it hits and, and has impact, it stops. And what happens is at impact is what we call maximum deformation. This ball, when it collides with the earth and it's at its lowest point, becomes deformed. In other words, it takes on the shape of the earth. Why? Because if there's enough elasticity in this ball, it's going to take on the shape of the earth. And right before it begins to ascend upward, when it has impact with the earth, it begins to decelerate. So what all of this energy that was moving in a downward spiral in my life is now decelerating and it's beginning to come back up. And that's what happens with the ball. When we bounce, it has impact. And now it's moving upward. The ball has rebounded. That energy gets converted at impact and it begins to move in the opposite direction. That's going to make sense in a few moments. But when I bounce this ball, it goes down. The energy gets converted at impact and it then begins to move in the opposite direction. And the velocity is now pushing this ball upward. And now we have a full rebound. And that's what happens from a physics standpoint. And now I want to share with you the word of God and what happens in our life spiritually when we experience a fall and we have to bounce back and have a full rebound from a fall. Let me pray with you guys. God, I thank you for this word. I got I pray that this word is all of you and none of me, God. Touch your people with this word, God. Change our lives, God. Move me out of the way. Move my flesh out of the way so your people can be touched, God. I thank you for destroying yokes in our life right now, God. And anyone that is experiencing hardship right now, anyone that has experienced a decline, a dissension in their life right now, God, I thank you for a full recovery. I thank you that you are rebounding us all, God. And so, God, we give you the praise that none of us, as we receive your word, can be the same, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to read a little bit of God's word, because remember, we're talking about how do we rebound from a fall. And my story today is going to be found in Daniel chapter three. 
going to be reading verse 14 through verses 30 in the New King James Version. So if you have your Bibles with us, just join us. It's going to seem like a little bit of reading, but this is an interesting story. So join me and I'm going to pick it up at the 14th verse. And it says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true? Remember those words. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre and the psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? This is Nebuchadnezzar talking to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer this matter. If it's in this case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression of his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans and their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And these three men fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Now, I don't want to read that because I want you to get that. These three men fell down bound into the fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the cast into the midst of the fire? They said unto the king, true, O king. He says, but look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on, those, on whose bodies that fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heaps because there is no other God that can deliver like this. Now watch this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the providence or province of Babylon. And I thank God for this word because there's so much there. And here you see we're talking about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. But before we understand this story, let's just go back a few uh, chapters, because this is we have to understand that because of sin, uh, Israel is now under Babylonian captivity and their king, which was about around 600, 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar has been capturing other cities. 
And one of the things that you have to understand about Nebuchadnezzar is when he captures these other cities, he always takes the best, the best counselors, the best employees, the best uh, rulers that they have, the prettiest women. He takes the best of the best and he brings it back to Babylon. As a matter of fact, there was one instance where in Jerusalem, he actually went into the temple, raided and invaded the temple and took ornaments out of the temple to take back to worship his gods. But anyway, that's how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was acquired and now living in Babylon. They're now these men of God who have been serving their God, have now been forced to make their money in a pagan, sinful, worldly environment. And so as they're getting to know and understand their new environment, one thing I love about Daniel in Daniel 1 is he makes it uh, known very early that he's not going to change who he is. And so we saw that in the Daniel fast because Daniel said, you know what, king, I'm not going to eat from your table. And it wasn't about disrespect. It was about Daniel showing that his God was greater than any of their gods. And he says, just serve me vegetables and water. And that's where we get our Daniel fast from. He said, just serve me vegetables and water. And so while the king's men are eating their food, Daniel is eating vegetable and water. And we see God show himself that even after he's examined, he's stronger than the king's men. And now Nebuchadnezzar sees how strong Daniel's God is. And then when we turn over to Daniel 2, same thing. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he wants his dream interpreted. So what does he do? He calls all these smart men, all these smart astrologers in, and he says, please interpret this dream. And none of them can interpret their dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, if you can't interpret my dream, you don't get to live. And so they are afraid. So they go to this man of God, Daniel, and said, Daniel, please come and help us to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And Daniel and and, and his God, they go in. He goes in. He interprets the dream and now Nebuchadnezzar is now excited. He promotes Daniel to be a ruler in Babylon. And what does Daniel do when he's promoted? He promotes his boys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And now they're also rulers in the province of Babylon. So now we pick up our story in Daniel three. Because Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're employees of this Babylonian empire. And Nebuchadnezzar builds this nine foot Goliath statue. And he says, I want everyone to worship this statue. But uh, but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego says, we will not bow. And so there's a couple of snitches in the army of another nationality that comes and goes back to the king and says, we got some boys over here that won't bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't bow to our God. So what happens? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are called in before the king. And that's where we pick up our reading today when the king is asking them this question. And his question to them is, is it true? And that's the same question that I ask you and I ask myself today. Is it true? that we are true worshipers of God. Because what you have to understand is that Nebuchadnezzar was challenging their worship experience. He's challenging their worship experience when he says, is it true that you won't worship my God, that you won't bow before my idol? And that's what the question we ask ourselves or we should ask ourselves every day. Because every day, whether you realize it or not, you're faced with the same question. I'm faced with the same question. Who are we going to worship today? And yeah, we're not being threatened with a nine foot statue, but every day we have a decision to make. Who are we going to worship? And now our our idol is not a statue, but let me tell you what some of our idols are. Some of our idols are our jobs. Some of our idols are our children. Some of our idols are our family. Some of our, I mean, let me just really get myself in trouble. Some of our idols are social media. And social media, it, so what is an idol? Anything that when I wake up today, I'm going to spend more time worshiping than God. Anything today when I wake up that I'm going to put before God is an idol. So Nebuchadnezzar is, he's, he's threatening their worship experience when he says, is it true? And that's the same question we should ask ourselves every day when you get up. 
Who are you going to worship today? Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to give your time to? Social media, I even had to put a timer on my social media account. So when it says I've been on there for 10 minutes, I know it's time to get off. Why? Because I don't want to make social media and Facebook and Instagram an idol. He says, is it true? And so here we go with this ball beginning to descend. Because we got something that potentially could go wrong that's now going wrong. Because they answer him, and what you have to understand about your worship experience, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is your worship experience is going to be challenged. And Minister James a few weeks ago taught us best that our worship is going to cost us something. So every day when we get up, we need to understand that our worship experience is going to cost us something. What did it cost Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What was on the line for them? Their jobs. And their life. So when he asked them, is it true? What's there to sacrifice their jobs and their lives? And I love their response when he asked them, is it true? And I love these men of God because these men of God didn't bow. These men of God were showing that they were true men of God. See, being a Christian is not about me wearing a cross. Being a Christian is not about me having a bumper sticker that says I'm a Christian. Being a Christian is not about how good I can say I'm blessed and highly favored. Being a Christian and a believer is when my faith is challenged. Am I going to stand up and say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die? So when they're asked with this question, I love their response. I love their response. They said, you, we're not even going to respond to your answer, O king. And all, with all due respect, they're not being disrespectful, but they just know the God that they serve. They said, we're not even going to answer your question. But let me tell you about our God. Our God is able. Now watch this, I'm paraphrasing, but they say even if he doesn't deliver us, he's still our God and we're still not going to serve your God. So what does that mean? What is being said? There's two things we need to take from that. When our worship is being challenged, they said, number one, God is all powerful. Because when they say God is able, they're acknowledging that he has the power to even overcome this man's fiery furnace. But not only are they talking about his power, they're also referencing his sovereignty. When they say, if he doesn't rescue us, we still serve God. We serve God if he does, we serve God if he doesn't. And our theology needs that. Your and my theology needs to understand that we serve a God that may not rescue us the way that we desire to be rescued. When we serve a God that may allow us to get ourselves in a situation to where we fall. Because if we believe that every time something happens, God is going to rescue us a certain way when he doesn't, then our theology is destroyed. But he's God if he rescues us. He's God if he doesn't. And so at this point, Nebuchadnezzar, he's like, OK, OK. All right. The Bible says he becomes so enraged that his face becomes distorted. And he's so outraged that he begins to distort and pervert God's special number of seven. He perverts the number seven by saying, turn up the fire seven times hotter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our friends are beginning, just like the basketball analogy, they're beginning to fall. The thing that potentially could go wrong is going wrong. This potential energy is being converted and something that maybe you or I feared is happening. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar heats up the, the furnace. And you got to watch this because there's some things in there that we got to pay attention to. He said the Bible says he binds them. He binds them. And we have to understand that because we don't, I think we missed that in the scripture that before these guys were thrown in and fell, they were bound and it's one thing when you know you're going to fall to be able to catch yourself because that's what we do. We don't know when we're going to fall. We don't know how we're going to fall. But if we catch ourselves falling, we use our hands to, to slow up the fall. But he bound them before they fell. So now they have no control of this situation but to trust in God. 
And we have to be careful because this is how the enemy wants to get us. He wants to be able to bind us up and then throw us down. And so I want you to understand a couple of pitfalls to avoid when the enemy attempts to bind you up and throw you down and to put you in a deceleration mode. You got to understand something. That when the enemy binds us up, the, pit, the first pitfall to avoid is the temptation to resort to something that we used to be. A lot of times when we're bound and we're in a, in a sticky situation to where we're falling, we want to resort back to who we used to be. And the Bible says that all, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old man has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So don't get into the temptation to when you feel yourself losing control, when you feel your life spiraling out of control, that you want to resort back to things. That's why anytime there's a person that used to have an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction, when there's traumatic events in their life, we have to pay special attention to them. Why? Because the temptation is to go back to that place of comfort. And that's what we have to make sure we don't avoid that pitfall of going back to something that God has delivered us from. Well, the second pitfall we must avoid in these particular instances is the, the temptation to compromise our beliefs. When the enemy is raging on us, when the enemy is raging and beating on us and pushing us down, there's always going to be a temptation to take the easier road. Those Hebrew boys could have easily said, you know what? When they were called into the, to the king's office, they could have easily said, you know what? We're just going to tell him we're going to bow, but we're not going to bow. We will we'll bow, but in our hearts, we still serve God. It's almost like when we were a kid, and your mother used to tell you to sit down and you say, I heard kids would say, well, you know, mama, I'm, I, I'm sitting down, but on, on the inside, I'm still standing up. It's like we, we, we want to obey them on the outside, but on the inside, we think we, we have a different conviction. Well, these men stood with their conviction that they were not going to bow when their lives are on the line and when their jobs are on the line, they said we will not bow. And so now we have a ball that's descending because the scripture says that Nebuchadnezzar bound them up, threw them in the furnace, and they fell. And even the men that bound them up died because the heat was so hot. But the Bible says that they bound them up, threw them in the furnace, which was like a chute, and they fell. And we spend so much time talking about the fire that we never really talk about the fall. Imagine being bound up, thrown in the chute, and you fall. And that's what happened in our, in our basketball analogy. That ball is going to continue to descend because of gravity, a grin with the acceleration of kinetic energy. That ball is going to continue to descend until something collides, until that ball collides with the earth. That ball is going to continue to descend, and that's just what we see happening in this scripture. There has to be impact for this ball to stop its descension. There has to be impact. Let me say that again. Before this ball to stop falling, there has to be impact. For us in our life to stop spiraling out of control, there has to be impact. Let me say that again. For us to stop spiraling out of control in our life, there has to be impact. Let me say it another way. For us to stop spiraling out of control, there has to be divine intervention. Because in the physics term, this ball is not going to stop falling until there's impact, until there's a collision, the physics say. Well, what is our collision in this scripture? There is a collusion is the word that I want to use between their faith and their spirit. Their faith and God's spirit is colluding enough to stop the free fall, to change the direction, to decelerate what the enemy had designed for bad. And now, Things can begin to turn up because what do we see? We see Nebuchadnezzar that says, wait a minute, I thought I put three people in the fire. He says, but when I look in the fire, I see four people and the fourth. Now watch this. He says the fourth looks like the son of man. Even this man that's worshiping these pagan gods, he is now being introduced to the son of God and he recognizes him as the son of God. 
And then he says something so important. He says, you know what? Wait a minute. I know I threw, threw three people in there, but now I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. But not only did I put, see, th throw three in there and there's four, but I put them in their bound. I put them in their bound and they were falling. But now as I look at them, they're free and they're walking around. And that's what happens when there's collusion with the Holy Spirit. When our faith colludes and, and, and collides with the Holy Spirit, we get freedom, we get unbound, and we get freedom. And so now this ball is changing its course. Now deceleration has begun, and now we're on the rebound because of an interruption by the Holy Spirit. And now Shadrach Meshach and Abednego are on the rebound. They bring them out, they bring them out, and, they're, and, 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 and I love this because the Bible says that all the governors, all the, 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 the agencies, all of the uh, astrologers, all of the, the princes, all of the, the dignitaries, everybody that had witnessed them being thrown and bound and thrown into the fire now get to witness them being delivered. You talk about advertising now. Now, king, you've got to proclaim that this is your king now. You now have to proclaim that the king of kings and the Lord of lords is your king. You just witnessed a man, three men get thrown into a fire that you turned up seven times hotter. And now you saw the son of God. And now they come out. And guess what? The Bible says they didn't even smell like what they had been through. And that's what happens when there's a divine collusion with the Holy Spirit. Pastor Bell did such a great job over the last few weeks talking about the scars and being wounded. And essentially, once you have a scar, there's a reminder that there was a traumatic uh, encounter. But when God heals us through his interaction, even though you can see through your testimony that you've been through something, there's no more pain associated with it, though. Even though I can see that I have a scar, even though that there's a reminder that God took me through something, there's no stench of the pain that was associated with that fall. That's why we must allow the impact of the Holy Spirit to interrupt our fall. Because when he intercepts us and when he uh, uh, changes the direction of what has, was designed for bad and turn it for good, then he takes away the pain that was associated with that fall. Now they're on the rebound. Now they're on their way up. And I'm so glad that they didn't have to avoid their fall because sometimes we want God to take us away from having to fall I'm so glad that we have an instance here where they were able to go through the fire. I'm so glad that God didn't just allow them to avoid it, but he allowed them to go through it. Because now we have a testimony of men who love God, love him so much that they wouldn't allow man and society to say, this is how we're going to do it. They say we're going to serve God. And even if he doesn't, rescue us he's still God so I want to ask you this question how big is my rebound how big is my rebound and that's the question that we ask ourselves because I believe at some point we're all going to rebound when it happens or how it happens I don't know that but how big is my rebound I liken that to this, to this example that God reminded me of. We don't ever know when we're going to be tested. We don't ever know, know how we're going to be tested. We can rest assured, though, that we're going to be tested, which means that God is not going to allow us to avoid all fiery trials. But when we're tested, just know that God is sitting back watching with us, proud of us. Why? Because he knows that he's already equipped us to pass his test. So when you're tested, when I'm tested, 
I don't have to be concerned. I don't have to fret that I don't have everything that I need. Because I'm reminded of the scripture that says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So how big is my rebound going to be? Greater is he that is in me than is in the world. He that is in the world. How big does my bounce back become? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What does my rebound look like? It depends on who I have on the inside of me. Greater is he that is in me than is in the world. What does my rebound look like? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There was one ball that bounced back. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We bounce back when we have the Holy Spirit colluding, agreeing, conforming with our faith. At that ball's lowest point, when it hits the surface, is when God is beginning to turn things around. At our lowest point, when we think no one's there with us, is the point that God is impacting our lives for a rebound. So what I have to understand that my rebound is correlated with my God. Do I have God on the inside of me? Greater is he when my test that is in me than he that is in the world. You have what you need to rebound on the inside of you. Allow your faith to collude with God's spirit. There's so much that God didn't allow you to avoid. There was so much that he allowed you to go through. Why? Because he wanted your test to be a testimony. And he knew he put enough in you to bounce back no matter what the enemy throwed at you. So I'm grateful that your days, your brighter days are ahead of you because we have the greater one on the inside of us. God, I thank you for your people today, God. I thank you that there's anyone that was watching this that says, I have fallen. I got a bad diagnosis from the doctor. I lost my job. I don't know where my next paycheck is going to come from. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know how far you've fallen. But one thing I know is that the greater one is on the inside of us that enables us to bounce back. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your bounce back is higher, that your rebound is higher than where you started. Why? Because God is on the inside of you and he has made a way of escape even while you were bound, even when the enemy thought he had you down. God had already made a way of escape. So God, touch your people today. Deliver your people. Heal your people. Encourage your people, God, to know that you are still in control. Even in the midst of the fiery trial, you are there with us, God. You are there all the time, waiting patiently. So we put our trust in you, knowing that however you choose to deliver us, you are our God. And we will serve you. So, God, I love you. I praise you for your people. Anyone that needs to know you as their savior, anyone that's watching that doesn't know you as, your, as their savior, God, I thank you that they would say this prayer with me. God, I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. Anything that's not like you, God, I confess my sins before you and I acknowledge that you are Lord and savior and that you died and you rose from the grave that we now can have salvation and that we can have life and that more abundantly, God. Touch your people. Touch those that are hurting, God. Touch those that need a touch from you, God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that this message was beneficial to you and I pray, this is what God gave me, that this just lifted you up for you to know that we are on the rebound. It doesn't matter what this situation looks like. 
God is with us and he is controlling our footsteps. And so I'm glad that you joined in today. I'm excited. Next week, I'm going to be talking about how to protect and serve through the spiritual authority that God has given you. We got something special for you. I'll be coming back next week. So we'll see you next week. We love you. Let me say this. I can't say this enough. We love you and we thank God for you. And we look forward to serving you. We can't wait till we see you again. But until then, same time, same station next week. God bless you. We love you. Did you get that?